Hey, what's up? Hello, everyone. Welcome into Fantasy Film Ball, the show where we turn movies into sports and sports into something we don't talk about here. My name is Matt. My name is Dill, and it's time for the channel awards for the 2023 film season. We did an award show last year where Matt and I put our picks together and we came up with a top five, but we figured, you know, it would be a little cooler if we had more nominations because we don't always agree. So this year, we're just going to name our favorite top fives and maybe some correlate, maybe some don't, and whatever films we mentioned will make up the category. I think it's honestly better this way, especially because this year we disagreed a lot. In 2023, what ended up happening a ton was you would come out of a movie be just glowing about it, and I would go, yeah, it was good. So we would not have a lot of crossover, and it would make our awards chaotic, for one thing. Also, I think neither of us would be very happy with how our mutual awards ended up. So we're both doing our individual awards, and I'm really excited for this. This is the official end to our coverage of the 2023 season. It's been a great time talking about this specific group of movies, but after today, we're done with that. We're on to the next. I think the best way to kick off our award show this year is say, we're an Oscars channel. We talk about the Oscars all the time, but this award is anti-Oscar because we're going to be nominating our favorite films that got zero Oscar nominations. Our Redeemer Award. We want to shout out these movies that the Academy overlooks. So Matt, what are your five nominees in this category? I have seen 197 films released in 2023, which are going to be my list that I'm considering. For this Fantasy Film Ball Redeemer Award, I'm going with five movies outside my top 10 films of the year that did not get Oscar nominations. In fifth place, I have The Five Devils. At number four, I have Rice Boy Sleeps. At number three, Wes Anderson's second best film of the year, Asteroid City. At number two, Blackberry. And the winner of the Redeemer Award is Priscilla, directed by Sofia Coppola. I'm going to do the same thing as Matt. Any film that made my year-end top 10 is automatically excluded from this list. And I have to give one shout out. It hasn't officially come out yet, but I did see it in 2023. That is the Korean horror film Sleep. But... Maybe next year's list. So my number five film here is going to be one a lot of you out there will be upset about. But hey, it's Disney's Wish. You know, the Wish Avengers, we got to come together. It's a category where I can give it some love. Number four is Ava DuVernay's Origin. Wish Neon pushed it a little bit more. Number three is Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Number two is Ben Affleck's Air. And number one, David Fincher, The Killer. We're going to be moving on to our next category, which honors the best music supervision and soundtrack. You could also call this best adapted score, I suppose, in opposition to original score. To start off my list, I'm going to honor the Color Purple soundtrack. At number four, of course, the music of Leonard Bernstein is the beautiful backdrop to Maestro. At number three, it's amazing how Sofia Coppola built a soundtrack album without using any Elvis for her Elvis movie, Priscilla. At number two, the melancholy and beauty of the holdovers comes through those song choices, the Cat Stevens on there. And the winner of my award for best music supervision or soundtrack is, of course, Barbie. And then for my five in the best music supervision soundtrack category, fifth slot goes to Priscilla. Everything Matt talked about, fantastic work. Perfect Days is my number four. The songs they use to curate this film are just, they're perfect needle drops. The Iron Claw is number three. So many fantastic songs featured in that film. And number two, maybe a little bit of a shock with my sweater here, but Barbie is in the number two slot. My number one is Renaissance, a film by Beyonce. I mean, technically there, there is a soundtrack here to supervising the documentary, even if it is live performing of these songs. The next category we're going to be talking about is best choreography, stunts, and dance. This is going to cover the coordination of stunts, so not just the craziest stunts, but the actual movement of them, as well as the choreography of dance sequences. At number five, I have Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves, which I think just has some stellar fight sequences. At number four, I have The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar and three more. The choreography in this I think is so beautiful. Every single movement is perfectly crafted to make this film flow. At number three, I have Taylor Swift, The Eras Tour. The choreography in this show is 
spectacular. At number two, The Color Purple, which has some outstanding dance sequences, and the work done with background actors in their movement is exceptional. And the winner of Best Choreography, Stunts, and Movement is John Wick Chapter 4. We have some overlap here in this category because my number five is the color purple for all the same reasons that you just mentioned. The opening song is a perfect example of amazing musical choreography. At my number four slot, I have Barbie. It made it into stunts at SAG, but I'm more talking about the dance choreography that I'm Just Ken sequence is just phenomenal. Number three, I share a music doc with you, but I'm going with the other major one from this year, Renaissance, a film by Beyonce. My number two is Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, and that leaves my winner as John Wick, Chapter 4. And then an award I truly love is voiceover and mocap performance. For me personally, I limit this just like the Oscars do for song. I only put two from a certain film. That way, I don't have five Spider-Verse people this year. My number five is going to be Bradley Cooper in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. You get a great close with his character. And then I'm going to have double Spider-Verse people in my three and four slots with Shamik Moore and Daniel Kaluuya. Moore has such energy in his role as Miles Morales and also a allows him to have some good dramatical moments. And I mean, Cluia just steals the show with his voiceover performance. Number two, I mean, the Morbs, they continue. Chris Pine and Wish. This is just a fun performance and a fun movie. But my number one is going to be from the dubbed version of The Boy and the Heron, that being Robert Pattinson. Unfortunately, I never saw the dubbed version of The Boy and the Heron, so I, I can't honor Robert Pattinson, unfortunately. But I will start off at my number five with Shamik Moore from Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. It really thematically sells this kid who is very lost in life and, and looking for acceptance. At number four, Mary Elizabeth Winstead from Scott Pilgrim Takes Off. Technically a TV series, but if it's on Letterboxd, it counts. That's how I'm going to play it, and it's our awards, so get used to it. At number three, I have the joint nomination of Amy Donald and Jenna Davis for Megan. At number two, the joint nomination of Bradley Cooper and Sean Gunn for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 as Rocket Raccoon. There's something special about this one and the emotion that is brought by Rocket Raccoon. And my winner for voice acting and motion capture is Haley Steinfeld for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Honestly, one of my favorite performances of the year. A performance that really speaks to the themes of of this movie. Again, looking for acceptance. Our next award is one that we are not going to name five nominees because this is the honorary live action animal performance. And this year is anyone else than Messi from Anatomy of a Fall portraying Snoop. He is truly fantastic in this film. And then for our next award, best youth performance. And obviously youth is in a quotation. We're counting this as 21 and under. My number five is Madeline Univoiles from The Creator. She adds a lot to that character. Number four is Calla Lane for Wonka. My number three is going to be Storm Reed for Missing. She carries this film on her shoulders. She's on screen for the entire runtime. Then at number two, we have the old man himself, Dominic Sessa in The Holdovers. And my number one, Not in the Fall, Milo Machado Grainer. This isn't the last time you'll see him in my personal list. So I'm going to do this category, but I'm going to take a little bit of a different take on it. Instead of doing youth performances, I'm going to do breakthrough performances. Performances of people that I didn't really know before this year. And now I am very glad to say that they are actors that I am very much watching out for how their career continues to develop. Number five, Phoebe Dynavor in Fair Play. At number four, Charles Melton in May, December, which is a masterclass for reasons that everyone else has been talking about for months. At number three, Yu Teo for Past Lives. So subtle and so brilliant and heartbreaking. At number two, Kaylee Spaney for Priscilla. And number one, Davine Joy Randolph for The Holdovers. No, I didn't know her before this year. I had seen Dolomite as my name. I would not have been able to name her, but now she is definitely one of my favorite actors out there. That is going to bring us to Best Ensemble. These casts, however you want to look at them, they're just nailing their roles. My number five is coming from a comedy. It is going to be the cast of Bottoms. I just think this is such a fun ensemble, top to bottom. Each character has a moment to shine. And you can kind of say the same thing for my next nominee, Rai Lane. Obviously, we have a lead too, but each little side character they meet along the way all leads a 
lasting presence. Number three, they're on my shirt, Barbie. This is one of the biggest ensembles of the year, filled of stars. Each can, each Barbie, and even Alan all shines inside the film. Number two, and this was a very close race for me, is going to be American Fiction. I think the core family of this film all are so impactful, and then the other side characters we meet throughout the film all have their moments to shine. I say moments to shine a lot because our number one is exploding with moments to shine being Oppenheimer. Obviously, we have Killian Murphy, Robert Downey Jr., Emily Blunt, Matt Damon. This ensemble, it's truly what ensembles are all about. For my ensemble category, starting us off at number five, Rye Lane. Like you said, small but very mighty. Everyone in this, even in their brief runtime, really shines and the two lead actors are spectacular. Number four, The Color Purple, a beautifully supportive ensemble where everyone is working to lift everyone else up. At number three, Asteroid City, a massive ensemble where everyone just perfectly fits into their part and knows exactly what the film requires of them. At number two, Oppenheimer. There are so many actors that are so recognizable and they're all turning in really great work. And my winner for best ensemble is Poor Things. Very small ensemble, but every single person is working at the top of their game. That is going to bring us to the best casting. One of the Oscars we'll be having here in just a few years. We're ahead of the curve. We're having it now. My number five is going to be the Iron Claw. I mean, casting Zac Efron in this role, I think is picture perfect casting. And then the rest for this Von Eric family all just seems like these actors were made for these parts. Number four, I talked about an ensemble, but it's American fiction. Pulling Jeffrey Wright, putting him into this leading role, and then finding all of these little side characters for the rest of the film all fill out their roles to perfection. Number three, Emma Stone, performance of the year. Casting her as Bella Baxter is truly a feat of casting perfection. And then number two would be Killers of the Flower Moon, the Osage representation in this film. Lily Gladstone and even having Leonardo DiCaprio play against type, I think is all great casting. But my number one, just like ensemble, for all the reasons I mentioned over there, is Oppenheimer. For my casting category, I have to start off with Bo is Afraid at number five, which not only has Joaquin Phoenix, playing the most neurotic version of himself, it also casts some people in roles that I would not have expected. For example, Patti Lupone jumping over from the theater, as well Nathan Lane playing the absolutely ridiculous suburban father, even down to the casting of the extras, specifically the crazy people out on the street outside Bo's apartment. The casting is perfection from top to bottom. At number four, Oppenheimer, in which I think the casting really works to keep you grounded in the film and where you are and who everyone is. You never lose track of who each character is supposed to be because you already have associations with those actors. It is truly a feat of casting to be able to balance this many roles and make them all distinct. At number three, Killers of the Flower Moon. As you said, the representation is exceptional here. Providing a platform for the Osage to represent themselves on screen is a landmark moment in cinema. At number two, Poor Things, I think, has perfect casting from Rami Youssef all the way to Emma Stone. Every single person is tailor-made for their roles. At number one, Asteroid City, which again is a massive ensemble in which every single person and their little quirks and idiosyncrasies comes together to make the wonderful, weird film that is Asteroid City. The next category we're going to be talking about is Best Visual Effects. And to start my category off at number five, Poor Things it uses set extensions in a really exciting and fresh way. And I love the way that it uses the LED screen technology that we've seen so many times now in order to replicate old-fashioned styles of filmmaking with matte paintings and backdrops. At number four, Oppenheimer, something I was railing against all year long. Recently when I watched it, I realized that there's a lot of creativity going into the choice of how to represent a lot of these visual ideas. No, the explosion is not Oscar worthy. However, there is a lot of interesting ideas being employed here and very simple things that show a lot of creativity. And number three, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which looks like nothing else that I've ever seen. At number two, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, which uses mocap in such a brilliant way and perfectly blends practical sets with 
CGI. And number one, the creator. It is a miracle what they did on that budget, and the film looks stunning. For my visual effects number five, I have Gran Turismo. Movie, it's kind of okay, but the VFX I think are truly phenomenal. I love how they transitioned from the real world into the racing sequences. It, it's seamless and it just looks so cool. My number four is Poor Things. You talk about the set extensions, the LED screens. I love them as well. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is my number three. Same thing you talk about the mocap performance for Bradley Cooper for Groot are very, very impressive. And I also like some of the other sequences they use VFX for. I think Guardians is one of the few Marvel movies nowadays that knows how to use its VFX budget. At my number two is Napoleon for some of the similar reasons as Poor Things. It's using these set extensions. It's making these battlefields so large, so vast. But my number one is just like you, the creator. It is so impressive. You know, if we did our ballots together, the creator would still win. And that's the rightful winner here. The next category to talk about is best makeup and hairstyling. At number five, I really like to honor some horror in this category. So I'm going with Talk To Me, which not only has the most horrifying ghosts and ghouls of the year, but everything that Joe Bird goes through in this film, the destruction of this poor kid's little face is uh, horrifying. And it's what cements this movie as one of the scariest films of the year. At number four, Bo Is Afraid, which has a lot of hair work, a lot of makeup work to transform Joaquin Phoenix throughout the time that he ages to give him the beard to show him withering and growing old even just having him in general looking like he's aged 30 years just from stress at number three maestro and this is not just an award for bradley cooper's nose it is also an award for the stunning work done in aging both carrie mulligan and bradley cooper throughout the film kazuhiro is probably the best in the game. At number two, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, which had the most prosthetics in any film ever and somehow still missed out on an Oscar nomination. Just to look at that planet, Other Earth, where all of the people are just animals and fursuits, that is one of the most incredible sequences of makeup. Not to mention, I, I can't remember the name of the character at this point, it's been so long since I've seen it, but the character whose face is basically peeling off through the entire movie, brilliant makeup work. And at number one, Poor Things, which has, of course, the disfigured face of Willem Dafoe. But not just that, there is also the brain surgery scenes, all of the dead bodies. It does such a great job of balancing traditional period piece makeup and body horror stuff. Sadly for my list for makeup and hair sound, I had to cut Poor Things, but I want to give it an honorable mention right what? here. My number what five slot is Diane Nyad herself. Nyad gets in the work they do to showcase how she gets sunburnt throughout the film. It looks so realistic. The way her face puffs up throughout the time in the water. I mean, even if you don't like the movie, the makeup in this film is really, really good. Barbie is my number four. I'm a sucker for hairstyling in films, and I think Barbie has the best hair styling of any film to come out in 2023 not just on stereotypical barbie herself but on the rest of the barbies the rest of the kins i just think the, the hair they give all of them are so noticeable so distinguishable without seeing their faces you can tell who is what specific barbie number three is another film like naiad even if you don't like this film you have to marvel at the makeup work and maestro i think that the work on bradley cooper and carrie mulligan is just truly fantastic and then the hair work on each of them as well well, just really adds to selling you that this is Leonard Bernstein. This is Felicia Bernstein throughout the entire film. My number two is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. For all the reasons you said, there's so much they're doing this film as well as on the villain himself. But my number one, I'm very partial to horror films, is Talk To Me. What you talk about them doing to Joe Bird's character still is ingrained into my head and is truly one of the best feats in makeup and hairstyling in recent horror the next category to talk about is best original song. And to start off my five, I'm going to have to go with a Barbie song, but maybe not one of the ones you'd expect to have in a top five, because I love Charlie XCX's Speed Drive, which I think is just such a fun song. It's one that always is stuck in my head when I think about this movie. At number four, Keep It Moving from The Color Purple. It's very rare in a movie version of a stage musical to have the new song added be one of the best songs in it. At number three, Megan The Stallion 
Stallions out Alpha the Alpha from Dix the Musical, which I think is Megan the Stallion's best song that she has ever made. Really creative in how it uses these sort of Broadway instrumentals coupled with Megan the Stallion's flow and delivery. At number two, Am I Dreaming from Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which is one of my favorite songs of the year. And my winner is, of course, Billie Eilish's What Was I Made For from Barbie. Just like the Oscars, I follow the max of two her film so sadly Billie Eilish is on the outside looking in but oh. she, she would be in my list if I didn't have this parameters because at my number five again wish Avengers we show up this is the things I get <sighs> I think this is such a great villain song Chris Pine oozes with charisma in this song keep up with the comedy songs Sweet Tooth Wonka. This is the most catchy song in this film. I love the way they play it out. I think Wonka gets a little too much flack for its songs because yeah, they're a little corny, but they're corny just like how the film is and it just works for me. My first Barbie song I'm mentioning in my top five is number three, Dua Lipa, Dance the Night. It works inside the film and really works outside of the film as well. My number two, I have this long history with the troll songs. I don't like the trolls movies, but the trolls songs are really good and Better Place I think is the best one yet. The instinct reunion Justin Timberlake's vocals here it's stuck in my head it was one of my most played songs in my 2023 rewind but my number one I mean can we get more enough than I'm just can at number one if we were going off of their Oscar performances, that would be my number one as well, because what an amazing performance that was. Our next category, keeping on the music theme, is Best Original Score. And to start off my five, I have to go with Joe Hisaishi's work on The Boy and the Heron, which is so minimalistic and beautiful. Hisaishi is one of my favorite composers of all time, and this ranks up with some of his best work. At number four, I have the work of Daniel Rawson and Christopher Bear from Past Lives, which is so beautiful melancholy. It really evokes the feelings of eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, which the film itself references. Number three, I have Jerskin Fendrix's work on Poor Things. To be honest, if I were to listen to an album of these scores, I would listen to Poor Things over and over and over. I actually think this score works better outside of the film even than it does within it. At number two, I have the final film score of the late great master of Japanese music, Ryuichi Sakamoto's Monster. Ryuichi Sakamoto is one of the greatest to ever do it, and this score just proves why. And at number one, I have Daniel Pemberton's work on Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which is so magnetic and electric. The use of leitmotifs is just absolutely inspirational. This is Film Composing 101. My score lineup kicks off at number five with the zone of interest. I think the way Michael Levy's score just feels like it's a character, the way it introduces us into the film as well as sending us out of the theater is haunting. At number four, I do have Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. As you mentioned, Daniel Pemberton's sequel score is even better than the first. It's so engaging and I love how many different styles he mixes into this film. At number three, I have a thousand and one, which I think is one of the most slept on scores of this award season. It reminds me a lot of the If Beale Street Could Talk score at times, and I just think it's very soothing to listen to. Number two, maybe surprising, is Ludwig Goransson's Oppenheimer. The way his score uses strings it's so impressive. Ludwig's the man. He can do no wrong. But number one, poor things. It's just so good. Like you talked about, it's, it's great outside the film, but I think it's phenomenal inside the film as well. It's like a character. It grows throughout the film and it just gets better on each subsequent show listen. The next category to talk about is Best International Feature, and starting my list off, at number five, from Canada, is Rice Boy Sleeps. At number four, the documentary from Tunisia, Four Daughters, which is a beautiful piece of documentary fiction hybrid. At number three, 20 Days in Mariupol, a masterful work of on-the-fly, breaking news, as it happens, documentary filmmaking. Now, I will say I am excluding past lives here, but past lives would be right here if I were including it. Number two, I have The Taste of Things, which is one of the most beautiful cinematic experiences I've ever had. Just the culinary beauty on screen is without parallel. And number one, of course, The Zone of Interest, one of the most unforgettable films of the year. My number five in an international feature is Four Daughters. It's a great blend of telling the story while also recreating it. 
Honestly, for best casting, it would have been one of my alternatives if I had to make a long list for the category. At number four is going to be Perfect Days. I think this film is just such a delight. It's, it's an easy watch, but it's also a watch that sticks with you long past the conclusion. Number three is 20 Days in Mario Pool. For all the reasons you just said, I think it's one of the most important films of the year. It's a truly haunting film, just like my number two being the zone of interest. Pretty much any other year, this would be my number one in the category, but when Anatomy of a Fall is here, it just has to take my number one slot. I think this film is phenomenal. The ensemble here is great, and the screenplay is just so perfect. In the best documentary film category, I'm really excited to talk about some of these picks because uh, there, there were a lot of very good documentaries this year. My number five is Once Upon a Time in Uganda, the story of Wakaliwood. It's so, so fun. What an incredible story. And number four, Orlando, My Political Biography, a radical experimental essay film, which takes a classic piece of fiction by Virginia Woolf and updates it with a modern understanding of queer theory. And number three, American Symphony, the John Batiste documentary, which surprised me with how non-ego driven it is. It's just a beautiful film about the creation of art and tragedy. And number two, Four Daughters, for all the reasons I said before, it is a, a stunning blend of fiction and documentary unlike anything I've seen outside of the rehearsal by Nathan Fielder. And at number one, of course, 20 Days in Mariupol, the most shocking and haunting film of the year. On the flip side, my documentary feature lap kicks off with Taylor Swift, The Eras Tour. This was a very fun time, but I will say it got outshined by another concert doc later in the season that made me kind of forget about this one pretty much overall. But Four Daughters is at my number four slot. American Symphony is my number three film in this category. I think the duality between tragedy and triumph in this film is greatly executed and just lets you know a lot more about its central figures without coming off as like, oh, look at me, I'm the greatest in the world. Number two is 20 Days in Mariupol. My number one in the documentary feature category this year is Renaissance, a film by Beyonce. I think it's the perfect example of what a concert doc should be. You get the behind the scenes of how these songs come to be while also seeing them performed on stage. I saw this in Dolby. The sound design of this film is just so, so, so captivating. The next category is the best animated feature category. To start off my list, I'm going with the fully painted film, The Peasants, a Polish film that uses oil painting for every single frame, looks absolutely gorgeous. Number four, cheating a little bit, Scott Pilgrim takes off the Netflix animated miniseries. This is a wonderful update to the Scott Pilgrim universe. At number three, Hayao Miyazaki's The Boy and the Heron, a beautifully crafted film that still confuses me a little bit, but one that is definitely a piece of art. At number two, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem it takes the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and gives them real heart. Finishing my list off, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is my winner. It is just one of the most exceptional achievements in animation that I've ever seen. It can't be a Dylan list without a little chaos. My number six doesn't make my top five, but the fact that this was my number six in anime feature, Paw Patrol the Mighty Movie, fun, time. Number five though is Trolls Band Together. I think this is the best of the trilogy so far. My number four is going to be Wish. You know, Wish Avengers is like my third nomination for it so far. It's just a fun time. I know it's not the best thing in the world, but I think the music's fun. I think the voice cast is having a great time and the movie moves along pretty fast. Number three is TMNT Mutant Mayhem. I grew up a turtle head. I love the needle drops in this. Just a great animated film overall. My number two film is going to be Elemental. I just really admire the way they go in talking about their subject matters here but number one has the best anime feature of the year being spider-man across the spider-verse just truly a feat of what the animation feel can offer i think this is one of the best animated movies we've gotten this decade so far the next category is best sound and i'm going to start off with a controversial pick because at number five i'm taking spider-man across the spider-verse i know there were complaints about the dialogue being mixed a little bit too low but personally i i believe that there is a lot more to sound than just the dialogue mixing outside of the first sequence it's not a problem in the movie what this film does in building the soundscape building the world using the foley to create these different characters i i think it's just absolutely masterful at number Number four, Maestro. The sound mix on this is absolutely stunning. Even listening to this on crappy speakers on your TV or laptop, you can just feel the work making the music 
integrate into the world of the film. At number three, Oppenheimer, not just for the bomb going off, but also for the gymnasium scene, which is a masterful work in creative sound editing, the way that they choose to include or exclude sounds. At number two, the taste of things, uh, just hearing things cook, hearing things sizzle, hearing pots and pans clinking around, it becomes like music. And at number one, the zone of interest. What can I even say about the zone of interest? This film lives and dies on its sound, and it brings you into the world of the Haas family as they purposefully ignore what's going on right next door to them. And throughout the film, we find ourselves doing the same thing as what first starts out being horrifying gradually just becomes background noise. It is incredible sound work. One of my favorite sound works of the year is my number five being The Killer. I watch this at home on my TV through Netflix and I could still hear each and every movement that they make, whether it's with the guns, whether it's with the cars, the bikes, the hand-to-hand -hand combat. David Fincher films always have fantastic sound and The Killer is no exception. My number four is Napoleon, the cannons, guns, the swords, the horses, the yelling in the battlefields. I just think it all comes together to make a great war epic. I've mentioned this film a few times, but hey, it fits right here in the sound category perfectly well, and that is Renaissance, a film by Beyonce. When I watched this, I felt like I was transported back to the concert. It just places you like you are there, and you feel each hit of the beat and it's just so well done but my top two are truly phenomenal and that's why they were battling head to head at the oscars because my number two is oppenheimer as you said the gym scene is fantastic as well as this times to use no sound like when the bomb goes off but then the zone of interest we had a whole best picture revisiting episode going into the sound with an actual sound editor and they said it better than I could ever could about why the zone of interest sound is amazing. However, our next category is going to be production design, and I want to keep up this zone of interest love because here is another category where I am giving it some love at my number five slot. The decision to place the camera inside the house in hidden spots so the actors don't know, I think is truly a feat, and that's all due to the production design. They had to create spaces recreating this house from history. I mean, it was like right down the road, and my four and three kind of go hand in hand because they both star Joaquin Phoenix, but my number four is Bo is Afraid. I'm figuring you're going to talk about this, so I'll save that over for you. But my number three is Napoleon. I just think the grandness. I talked about visual effects, the set extensions. It looks so vast, and I am a sucker for stuff like this, but my number two is Poor Things. Set extensions, boom, but it's a Yorgos Lanthimos film. There's always going to be stuff in the background. The hidden elements of Poor Things is what really elevates it up my production design list, but my number one is going to be Barbie. Dreamland is just a remarkable creation, and you know what? I'll say it. I like some of the real world stuff. I think the design of the Mattel building is pretty cool. Even the little school they go to, it, it has some little nice calls in the background of stuff. Not nominated for me, but I want to give a shout out to Rye Lane. The use of colors is just gorgeous. Unfortunately, it doesn't make my top five. Now, something you're going to notice, I love fantasy production design work. I love stuff that just doesn't feel quite attached to the real world. So my list is full of that. Number five, I have Barbie. Shockingly low for something so well done, because you just said it, Dylan, recreating these plastic play sets as real life things is, is just so, so well done. At number four, Asteroid City, Wes Anderson's first of two films on this list. They built a town in the desert, and that town looks stunning. Everything is just so odd, a little bit off, and yet it captures perfectly this specific time and place in American history. I'm always in awe of Wes Anderson production design because he does it for so cheap and yet it looks absolutely perfect every single time. And number three, Bo is afraid. There's a lot of reasons for this, down to the first apartment scene, the way that they destroy the apartment, the look of the street outside. But the real star of the show is the 10 to 15 minute sequence where Bo goes into a descent into the rest of his life, and we start to see these weird sets that shift and morph, and it almost feels like a cartoon world he's entering into. That is one of the most stunning sequences in film this year. Number two, Poor Things, is amazing in how it allows you to see the world through the eyes of a child. Everything is wonderful and amazing because that's how it feels to look through a child's eyes. It's just hilarious and creative and very gothic in a, a totally unique way that I've never really seen before. As well, the entire Lisbon sequence 
gorgeous stuff. But at number one, my other Wes Anderson movie here, again, technically cheating because it is kind of four movies, but that is The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar and three more. The collection of Wes Anderson shorts are some of the most stunning production design I've ever seen with every single sequence, every single shot being meticulously crafted as though every single thing in frame has been placed there perfectly and thought about for hours exactly how to get that placement. This doesn't even feel like it was made by humans. That's going to bring us to the category of best film editing at my number five slide. I have Renaissance, a film by Beyonce. They cross cut between the backstory of these songs as well as into the concert itself. My number four slide is American fiction. Comedy editing is one of the hardest things to do. American fiction has such fast pace quick cut editing that it makes these jokes even more impactful and this film flies by just like my number three film spider-man across the spider-verse there's so much editing here but it's so 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 impressive my number two is anatomy of a fall it's a courtroom thriller the edits are what makes us on the edge of our seats with the thrills in tandem with the screenplay the way they cross cut between the courtroom and that argument scene later on into the film i think is the true feat of editing inside of this film but my number one is a cross-cutting king of 2023 oppenheimer we have the two timelines and the editing is a big reason why those two stories work so well in tandem with each other. At number five, I have Oppenheimer here, which like you just said, uh, it is a feat of cross-cutting. It pulls it together in such a compelling and really cohesive way. At number four, The Zone of Interest, which they just shot hundreds and hundreds of hours and editing that down finding the moments that feel real finding the way to tell the story and also finding the way to not tell the story to break all cinematic conventions to avoid emotional development at number three Bo is afraid it grabbed me by the throat and held me there the entire way through for two poor things which beautifully switches between formats but not just that it allows you to see the development of Bella to see as the scenes go it takes you on a journey through Bella's personal development and her growth as a human being. And at number one, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Sometimes the most editing of the year is the best editing of the year. Costume design is a category I love every year because... I personally don't think I have a fashion taste, but I love watching people who do have a fashion taste. And The Hunger Games, Bout of Songbirds and Snakes has such great fashion in it. Just like my number four, Napoleon. We're throwing it back in time. We have the French, we have the war outfits, but we also have Napoleon's whole getup, his iconic hat. The stuff he wears while being emperor is just so bold, it's so flashy, and it just works for me. Poor Things is another example of being bold, of being flashy. Bella has phenomenal dresses throughout but i really like what the men wear too rami yusuf's character has some fantastic fits that i would see myself wearing if i had access to stuff like that my number two is renaissance a film by beyonce all the fits she was wearing on tour just i mean they're all here in this film so you know it's got to be high up here but barbie is the film that is inspiring so many iconic fits outside i mean i'm even wearing a piece of from the movie and I feel like that kind of makes me biased and has to put it at number one. My costume design category number five I have the wonderful story of Henry Sugar and three more. Wes Anderson's costume design is as good as his production design and the pieces picked for the wonderful story of Henry Sugar and three more blend so well with the production design. At number four the color purple which is so centered around the dresses around the gorgeous outfits creates beautiful designs both in the real world and some of the fantasy songs and dance sequences throughout. At number three, Priscilla, which brings us into the world of Elvis in a way very, very different from last year's Baz Luhrmann maximalism. This is very minimalist. It's very pulled back, and yet every costume is stunning. We don't see Elvis being flashy. We see Priscilla living her basic domestic life and feeling trapped like a bird in a cage. Amazing costume work to evoke that feeling. At number two, Poor Things, which I often feel like the costume design in this feels like what would happen if you allowed a third grader to design the costumes for a period piece with a crayon and a piece of construction paper. And that to me is wonderful because it goes with everything else in this movie. The whimsy, the weirdness, the feeling that it's just a little bit off and yet so wonderful. But at number one, 
Barbie. I hear a lot of people say, oh, that's not really an achievement in costume design because they didn't design the pieces. They already existed. Design is much more than just creation. It's also about curation. It's about going into the archives, finding pieces that work and putting them together in a way that feels right for the film. And Barbie is exceptional in how it does that. It is picking all the right pieces. It is making them work for the actors that they're chosen for. That is a massive achievement in my mind. That is now going to bring us to the category of cinematography and sometimes pretty lights and cool visuals is enough to get into my top five and that's the case of John Wick chapter four. There's just so much from this film if you just pause the screen boom there's a poster boom there's a wallpaper and then on the complete opposite side of being a gorgeous film we have the zone of interest at my number four slot for the visuals of this film. While they're not beautiful they're poignant. There's uh, that scene with Haas standing outside of his house by the little pool and you just see the smoke come from the factory while he's smoking. And then again, I have Maestro at number three, just reversing it back, going maximalism again. Bradley Cooper's camera here, Matthew Libertique's work is just so crazy. And sometimes you really want him in the words of the film to rein it in, but we don't want that. We just want to go crazy. The way it, it, it emulates what decade it's supposed to be, truly a feat. Number two is going to be Oppenheimer. We hear about the creation of IMAX black and white, but that's not all the film has to offer. Just the way it shoots these extreme close-ups is normally something I'm not a fan of, but I really like it in this film. And with the cross-cutting, the cinematography is showing you, hey, this is the time period that we're currently in. And it really helps move this film along. And then our number one, the achievement of cinematography for 2023 is poor things. So many different aspect ratios, so many different colors. Sometimes it's eye popping, sometimes it's devoid of color, sometimes it's wide angles, sometimes it's close angles, sometimes it's fisheye. There's just so much to offer here and it's just done so so well. At number five on my list is Asteroid City, which has this beautifully washed out pastel look to it. Honestly, I think it's one of the prettiest looking Wes Anderson movies outside of the Grand Budapest Hotel. The way that he uses negative space is exceptional. At number four, Godland, which is a stunning piece of work, not just because it uses Iceland's beautiful natural features, but it's also just the floating camera, the use of long takes. And number three, the taste of things, which is absolute food porn to watch them cook these meals and the use of natural light, the orange glow, the golden hour morning glow that you get here. This is a formal masterpiece. At number two, I have Maestro, which for all the reasons you just said, I just absolutely love it. It feels so evocative of the time periods that it's capturing. And there are so many moments that just feel like pure movie magic, the way the camera moves, the way the camera floats, the lighting design, and at number one, Poor Things, the best cinematography of the year, is so colorful and so creative in how it flips between different lenses and how it uses different shooting formats. There is no movie that looks like Poor Things, and I don't know if there ever will be again. Speaking of Poor Things, that is my number five in adapted screenplay. There's just so many great quotables from this film, and I think the writing from Tony McNamara is just so great, and so is Barbie from Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach. One of the funniest films of the year and I just really like how they took this idea of what most of us thought would just be a basic toy commercial and added some more depth to that. My number three in adapted screenplay is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I think the way they subvert expectations at time, add in all of these characters and do it so seamlessly, you never feel like anyone's pushed to the back and you're so engaged to all of these stories. Number two is Oppenheimer. I think Nolan's script here is pretty phenomenal. The way he wrote it in first person, I think is really cool. Even if I know nothing about script writing, overall, I just think Oppenheimer, it, while it does have some cringy lines, those cringy lines really, really work for me. But I can't rave enough about my number one in this category. My winner for adapted screenplay is American Fiction. I just think the way it goes about its satire is one of the best in recent memory. At number five, I have Priscilla, which is a very minimal script that goes so deep into the feelings of loneliness that Priscilla must have been experiencing at this time. And in the end, this comes out being perhaps the best film I've ever seen about abuse in a relationship. At number four, American Fiction, which for all the reasons you just said, this is a clever satire. It is so funny and it is deeply layered. I think this is going to age exceptionally well. At number three, Blackberry, which is just so 
funny. It takes the typical formula of the rise to power of a brand that we've seen in like the social network, or even this year with Flamin' Hot and Air, and flips it on its head by not just being about the rise to prominence, but also the fall. At number two, Poor Things, which is a perfect adaptation of the source material. But at number one, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, it's balancing hundreds of different threads and doing it all effortlessly in a way that keeps you involved, keeps you invested, and keeps you on track with exactly what's going on. The next category is Best Original Screenplay. I have to start my top five off with The Holdovers, which is just a beautifully emotional and impactful film that was not plagiarized. Excellent characters, great quotable lines, and a heart of gold. And number four, Asteroid City, one of the most confusing films that I've seen this year, and yet profoundly impactful, something that I know I'm going to love even more every single time I watch it. Number three, Bo is Afraid, which is a ridiculous uh, exercise in plot, a film that just goes and goes and goes at a monstrous pace. It's not about the dialogue, it is about what happens, how it happens, and how the conflict and stakes continue to escalate. And number two, Past Lives, which makes the mundane so profound. And at number one, Rye Lane, one of the best romantic comedies that I've seen in recent memory. So funny all the way through. It makes me want to be a person that waves at boats. My original screenplay category kind of has a trend here, which you will begin to see as we go through it. But at my number five slot, I do have Air. You talked about Blackberry over in the adapted screenplay. Air is another one of these movies. Obviously, it's not like blowing the doors down, but it's good for what it is. My number four slot is Elemental. I think the way it goes about talking about inter-element relationships is really cool. Uh, it's very impactful. I resonate a lot with what the film is trying to say and the way it goes about executing it. In my number three slot, I have a comedy here being Bottoms. Again, comedies, I usually love their scripts if they're done really well. Bottoms just pack so many jokes. Like It feels like every other line of dialogue has a joke and on each subsequent rewatch, you can find new jokes to laugh at. My number two is Anatomy of a Fall. I think the screenplay here is really, really phenomenal. It keeps you at the edge of your seat. You are gripped throughout. I can feel like Sandra goes either way if she did it or if she didn't. I think that's just a sign of the script's strength. But my number one slot is the same as yours, Ryan Lane. I think it's the perfect rom-com and I also hope I am someone who waves at boats. So the next category, I'm going to do a little differently than you are. You've got your actress and actor lineup for supporting, but I'm going to do a top 10 ungendered. I'm just going to do that. I feel like at this point, that's just how I personally want to do. No knock to anyone else. So I will start with my number 10 best supporting performance, and that is Patti Lupone in Bo is Afraid. One of the most oddly terrifying roles feels like Marlon Brando at the end of Apocalypse Now, where you've heard so much about this character all the way through, and then suddenly she's there. At number nine, Mark Ruffalo in Poor Things. Such a, a unique take on this role with one of the worst accents that I have ever heard in my entire life, but I love every second of it. At number eight, Charles Melton in May-December. The way that he portrays someone who is stuck in a state of arrested development, someone who's stuck as a child, it is a miraculous performance that only revealed itself to me really after reading about the film, after watching it. This is a star-making moment. And number seven, Juliette Binoche for The Taste of Things. This is perhaps the best role of her career, and she has had an amazing career. At number six, Willem Dafoe in Poor Things. He's the heart of Poor Things. The way that he's able to act underneath all of that makeup and be so clear in what he's feeling. This is another performance with one of the worst accents you will ever hear, and yet it is so charming. I think the bad accents in Poor Things are by design. It makes it feel very otherworldly, almost alien in a way, and Willem Dafoe is the most charming, lovable alien that you could imagine. At number five, Claire Foy, All of Us Strangers. This performance broke my heart three times over. I think specifically the coming out scene and the scene in the cafe near the very end of the film. It feels like she shatters my heart into a million pieces, only to pick them all back up and put them back together. At number four, maybe controversial, Yu Teo, I believe, is a supporting role in past lives. Very understated, very subtle. He's not doing too much because he is really trying to play his cards right. The scene in the bar, that is a masterclass. At number three, Davine Joy Randolph for The Holdovers. The scene in the party where she breaks down while trying to play the music is just one of the best 
moments in in film this year in my mind at number two ryan gosling in barbie who is so goofy a true golden retriever of a performance and probably the most iconic portrayal of any character this year and finally the winner of best supporting performance glenn howerton blackberry anyone who can yell for the majority of their screen time and not only be terrifying but also incredibly humorous and deliver the line i'm going back to waterloo where the vampires hang out completely seriously and still being a hundred percent effective with it that is a master class in performance he's long been one of my favorite comedic actors and now he's really flexed his skills in dramedy it's still very funny so it's not full drama I'll do supporting actor up first in my number five slot. Someone you mentioned in your top 10 being Charles Melton. I agree with everything that you said. Truly a star making performance. Number four is Robert Downey Jr. The Oscar winner for Oppenheimer. It's really like a change of pace for Downey. Like he still gets to play a type of character that we get to see him do, but it's a very different type on that same play. He is very good in this condescending villainous role. My number three is Ryan Gosling for Barbie. Ryan Gosling is probably the only person who could have pulled this role off this well and i wish i could put him higher on my list but sterling k brown is above him at number two he plays the comedy and the drama moments to perfection you laugh so hard at his one-liners and then you also feel deeply for what his character is currently going through but my number one is someone that you also mentioned being mark ruffalo and poor thanks the accent the one-liners the body mannerisms everything that's going into this role is just so great i I wish we could get more comedic performances from Mark Ruffalo because he's really good in this avenue. On the flip side, in supporting actress, my lineup is pretty crazy. You could say that's due to weak competition. You could say that's because of my crazy taste in films. But at number five is Madison Tevlin from Champions. Comedy is really hard to do. I think she pulls this off phenomenal. She has some of the best jokes of the year. This performance is still one I think about from time to time and get a nice laugh at. Number four is Julianne Moore in May, December. Kind of the reverse of Charles Melton where you can see the horror, you can see the self conceitness of this character ooze out on the screen and it's really hard to take an actress that you've known for your whole life and see them in a negative light but she just does that here when you look at Julianne Moore you're just so revolted by her character. Audrey McDonald is number three in origin. She's only in one scene but that one scene is one of the most impactful scenes of the entire year. Her performance carries that scene through that monologue where the camera just stays on her. Number two is Rachel McAdams in Are You There? God It's Me Mark. I another one of those performances where she's just a delight. She has such a great screen presence and in this film you get to see all of the Rachel McAdams-isms on point. But my number one, Jodie Foster, Nyad. This is truly the supporting performance of the year. She just has so much in this role that she's doing and she's doing it so well. She has so much positivity radiating off of her and I just think Jodie Foster delivers one of her best roles in a long, long time. On the other hand, in the best lead performance category, I'm gonna go pretty far off of what I think a lot of other people would do. Oh well, I think this just shows how different my uh, taste in movies this year was. I didn't really align with the consensus. I'll give some quick shout outs to people that are right outside my top 10 because I feel really bad that they're not in my top 10, especially with some of the ones that made it over them, which people are going to criticize me for. So Jeffrey Wright, American Fiction is a performance I really love, as is Greta Lee and Past Lives, exceptional work, and Andrew Scott and All of Us Strangers came very close to making my lineup. So let's get into the top 10. At number 10, Benoit Magimel for The Taste of Things. Like Juliette Binoche, there's such an understated quality to this work. The fact that Majumel and Binoche were formerly married and have a child together really contributes to the chemistry and to the love that they share on screen. At number nine, Anjanu Ellis Taylor for Origin. Taking this role who he goes through so much pain and finding such beauty. Number eight, this is shocking. This is <laughs> some I, I never would have expected to have Rachel Zegler from The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes in my top 10 for uh, best performance, but she is amazing. She plays the role of Lucy Gray Baird as though it was written specifically for her. I'm someone who thinks that like one of Jennifer Lawrence's top three performances is The Hunger Games. So, uh, you know, it, this isn't too off base for me, but yeah, Rachel Zegler is just exceptional in this movie. And Number seven, Joaquin Phoenix for Bo is Afraid. The neuroticism, the anxiety at play here. He is 
delivering definitely the funniest performance of the year in a way that makes you very deeply uncomfortable. Every time I see him in this movie, I just crack up in new ways. Number six, Phoebe Dynavor in Fair Play. Fair Play is a movie that just goes back and forth with the jabs. The script is so quick-witted. This is a star-making turn for Phoebe Dynavor, in my opinion, and I can't wait to see what else she does in the future. And number five, Bradley Cooper for Maestro. This is not just your average biopic performance. There is some unhinged subconscious at show here where it's like we're watching Leonard Bernstein come inside Bradley Cooper constantly. <laughs> As a young man, Leonard Bernstein has this charisma, this charm that is so fun to watch. The accent that he uses is just incredible. This is uh, a classic movie star performance. At number four, Kaylee Spaney for Priscilla. I said it before, but there's this delicate innocence to the character, just like Phoebe Dynavor, a complete star-making turn. At number three, Carrie Mulligan for Maestro. It is amazing how she just carries this entire movie. Yes, Bradley Cooper is awesome too, but Carrie Mulligan outshines him anytime they're on screen together. At number two, Margot Robbie for Barbie. I never would have expected to put Margot Robbie for Barbie here until I saw the movie, and I realized that her performance is just so deeply affecting. There's something stunning about how she experiences emotions in this film. It's clear every time she's experiencing these emotions, it's the first time she cries. And knowing Margot Robbie, obviously this is not the first time she's crying, but seeing Barbie cry, you believe this is the first time that this woman has ever cried. Each moment of this performance is a discovery in a similar way to my number one spot, the best performance of the year, Emma Stone in Poor Things, Every moment is a discovery. Every scene is a development. Every three scenes, it feels like you're watching an entirely new person and finding this coherent development of this woman growing older, growing up. It is masterful work. So I'm going to kick things off with actress this time around. And my number five may surprise you because it was also a near list, Matt, and that is Rachel Zegler for The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Yeah. I think she is one of the best upcoming talents. She was phenomenal in West Side Story. She is phenomenal here. And you know what? She's going to be phenomenal in Snow White too for all you haters out there. But yes, she was made for this role. At number four is Vivian Opara for Rye Lane. One of the best romances of recent time in that all all falls on her shoulders. At number three, on the complete opposite side of things, is Sandra Huller in Anatomy of a Fall. When she comes at you, you can feel it. That argument scene that plays in the courtroom it has so much energy to it. 2023 had a lot of great performances in the lead actress category, so she's only at my number three slot because Tiana Taylor is my number two for a thousand and one. And like any other year, she would easily be my number one. I, I've known her from music, but I've never seen her act before this. And this is just what I think is going to be the start of a long acting career. But my number one is the same as yours. Emma Stone, poor things. One of, if not the best performance of the decade. Just the way that she's able to bounce between the various stages of Bella Baxter throughout this film. We know that this was not filmed chronologically is even more impressive. She just does everything and she does it phenomenally well just like my five actors and lead actor because at number five is Zac Efron for the Iron Claw such a switch up from what we've known him for in the past he shows that he has his dramatic chops and he is going to be a great actor for these next few years to come my number four slot I had a decision to make by which performance from Joaquin Phoenix I want to put in my top five but I ultimately landed on Bo is Afraid this is one of Joaquin Phoenix's best performances in his career at number three I have Opara's co-star from Rye Lane, David Johnson, and he just sells the opposite side of what you have in a rom-com. He's so awkward, he's so shy, he's so nervous. You buy that it's natural, and you buy the connection, the comedy, the romance between these two, and he is just doing it just in a very different way from what his co-star is. My top two was a very, very hard choice, but at number two, I'm going with Koji Akusho for Perfect Days. He doesn't say a lot in this film. It's his eyes, it's his body mannerisms, it's just his movements and his grunts. It's just so good. And my number one is also someone who's not shouting, but he does talk, and he's on screen for the entirety of the three hours of Oppenheimer, and that is Killian Murphy. Truly a 
performance for the ages and I just think he's phenomenal. Now we're moving over to best director and at my number five slot is the madman who basically took a torch to 35 million dollars of A24's money and made the most insane IMAX experience that I've ever had in my life. That is the mad genius of Ari Aster. I know there will never be another movie like this. At number four, Tran An Hung for The Taste of Things. This filmmaker delivered pure formal mastery by making essentially the most artful version of an episode of Chef's Table that you've ever seen. It is a romantic, very slow moving, very methodical drama, which is so beautifully crafted the entire way through. At number three, Jonathan Glazer, The Zone of Interest. It is an art piece the whole way through with a clear, distinct vision guiding us every step of the way. It is a piece of anti-cinema, deliberately trying to break the conventions and start a new cinematic language. At number two, Joachim Dos Santos, Kemp Powers, and Justin K. Thompson for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. There's such an energy driving this film all the way through, and just the way that every single piece of this could have fallen apart so easily but doesn't is a testament i think to the directorial team knowing exactly what this film had to be at all times it is miraculous that this film was not a complete disaster and that goes to these three directors and number one yorgos lanthimos for poor things when we talk about a vision behind a film yorgos is the person that i'm thinking of more than anyone else he delivered one of the most unusual films of all time uh, a film that feels like it's ripped out of a Dr. Seuss book, everything comes back to Yorgos. And the movie is entertaining as hell, not just because of the script, not just because of the actors, but because Yorgos Lanthimos had the singular vision to bring it all together and make it work flawlessly. My number five in my best director lineup is Rain Allen Miller for Rye Lane. I just think we've talked about the creativity, the, the brightness of this film, and it all comes back from her direction. Number four, the flip side of that, I think is just a director showcasing everything that she can do in an expert level. I have a lot of issues with origin script, but its direction I think is phenomenal from Ava DuVernay. I just think this is her best film to date. A lot of the choices she makes in the director's chair are very remarkable, are very bold, and they all work for me. Number three is Jonathan Glazer for The Zone of Interest. Everything you said, this is one of the directing feats of the year. At number two, I have Yorgos Lanthimos. Again, backpacking off of what you said. He has this control over his films that makes everyone working on them just elevate to this extra level. We saw it with The Favorite. We see it here again with Poor Things. And I just love the energy that he brings to his films. But number one is going to be Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer. It's the culmination of his career. We've seen him do drama. We've seen him do action. We've seen him do thriller. And now we see them all come together here for a biopic. And I think he just knocks out of the park. Finally, the big one. We're moving to Best Picture, our top 10 films of the year. Starting us off, with my top 10 films of the year. This is very reflective of a lot of the movies that came out this year that people loved, I wasn't as hot on. You'll probably notice that throughout all of our nominations, I haven't mentioned Anatomy of a Fall a single time. Whereas, you know, clearly that's one of your favorite films of the year, Dylan. Oppenheimer has been missing from most of my categories outside of like ensemble and editing and visual effects. Pillars of the Flower Moon, nowhere to be seen for me. So, I am looking forward to, hopefully, 2024, I am more in line with the general consensus on films. But without further ado, my number 10 film of the year, 20 Days in Mariupol. It's more than a movie. It's a historical document. This, I think, will be the definitive historical document that describes the war in the Ukraine. This is terrifying and horrible to watch. And yet, it must be watched. It must be seen. You cannot turn away from this. It is too important. At number nine, Origin by Ava DuVernay. This movie blew me away with its meshing of documentary and fiction. Basically felt like a, a, a narrative version of Ava DuVernay's 13th documentary. I was blown away by how it blended together the story of this author, as well as hundreds and hundreds of years of oppression and caste systems had me deeply emotional by the end. Uh, I need to read the book that it's based on. At number eight, Past Lives, directed by Celine Song. When I first watched it, I didn't quite get it. And as I watched it later, I understood this is not a film about love. It is not a romance. This is a film about leaving all parts of a life behind. The most profound moments of beauty found in these mundane, everyday moments. And number seven, 
Wes Anderson's The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar and Three More, a collection of four short films, every single one of them distinct and yet fitting together perfectly. French Dispatch and this are cut from the same cloth, and I actually think this might be better. It really captures the tone of Roald Dahl absolutely perfectly. At number six, The Taste of Things. I keep saying this is food porn to the next level. It takes its time with each moment, savoring every bite. And it is a delectable main course of a film that'll have you wanting to clean the whole plate. Put that on your poster, Taste of Things. At number five, The Zone of Interest. One of the films this year that left me thinking about it nonstop after I left the theater. I could not get this movie out of my mind for the next five months. Is it the most rewatchable? Probably not. There, You can learn a lot more by rewatching it, but it is not one that you want to go back to much. It is... I think going to be seen as one of the most important films, if not the most important film to release this year. At number four, Rye Lane, a fantastic, whimsical, wonderful rom-com that takes the before sunrise, let's walk around the city and just fall in love genre of rom-coms, and it makes it into something more. It's so charming, it's so energetic, and it's buzzing with this sort of frenetic Gen Z energy that I can't wait to see more of in movies. I really want to see like the TikTok generation get a budget to make cool stuff, because this is what I think it's going to look like, and I think it's going to be wonderful and whimsical and redefine cinema in ways that we have not seen in the past. At number three, Bo is Afraid. This was a three-hour anxiety trip, and I loved every minute of it. It's one of the strangest films I've ever seen, but I, I am loving the weird, wild swings this year. Ari Aster made a huge gamble on this one, and he lost the gamble because people hated this movie. They did not go to see it, but I felt the general apathy Ari Aster didn't make this for anyone but himself, and I love that energy. And number two, Poor Things. Yorgos Lanthimos' crowning achievement. If any element of this movie went out of place, this could have been a massive misfire, and yet it is a marvel in every way. And number one, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. This is one of the most accomplished pieces of animation that I've ever seen. It's also a touching coming of age story about growing up and trying to find out how to be who you are authentically without fear of how others will judge you. The action scenes are amazing. The score is perfect. It does the multiverse just as well as everything ever all at once. With this film and that film, I don't think we ever need another multiverse movie. Those two have done it as good as it can ever be done. You know, you talk about being judged. I'm ready to be judged for my top 10 because kicking us off at number 10 is Napoleon. This film fucks metaphorically and literally. Joaquin Phoenix masterfully portrays this cunty, horny little douche and I'm so happy. You talk about Ari Aster blowing budgets. Ridley Scott gets to blow these budgets on these historical epics. Production design, costume design, sound, visual effects are all some of my favorites of the year as you saw with my nominations. At my number nine slot is going to be Bottoms, which I just think this is just such a fun time. Uh, is there much technical craft work here? No, but the script is hilarious. These performances from top to bottom are hilarious. At number eight is going to be American Fiction. I said this is an adapted screenplay, but the script here is truly remarkable. The way it goes about telling its satire, it's hilarious as well as hard hitting. The performances from Jeffrey Wright, from Sterling K. Brown, and the rest of the ensemble are some of the year's best. I have Anatomy of a Fall. This is a film that I truly adored on the first watch. I liked it a little bit less on a second watch, but I still think it's so thrilling. It's so engaging, and it's a film that I think I could watch countless times and still pick up on something new on each subsequent viewing. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, you talked a lot about it. This is one of the best multiverse films that we have ever gotten. I think this is one of the best Spider-Man films that we have ever gotten. It's so funny. It has such a cool visual art full style. Can't wait to see how this trilogy wraps up and beyond the Spider-Verse. We have Barbie. All the Kens, all the Barbies are perfectly cast. They all have this amazing connection between each other and I just think the comedy really works here. The film's messaging also really comes through very effectively where it's not too 
in your face. I love all the song and dance numbers, the costume design, the production design. Barbie is truly a feat that overcame all expectations. We are going to be having Rye Lane, and I think it's one of the best romantic comedies I've ever seen. Raiden Alan Miller's directorial debut is so bold, it's so fresh, and it's so stylistic. The wide-angle lenses, the eye-popping colors of the production and costume designs, and the very engaging script are just some of my favorites of the year, as you saw in my nominations, and both of these leads, I'd never seen them before, but now I'm going to check out whatever they are going to to be doing. Number three is Poor Things. This is just such a marvel from top to bottom. The production, the craft work, the acting. I mean, it may be my second most nominated film in my personal awards this year. Emma Stone gives a truly remarkable performance. Your Ghost is so creative behind the director's chair. Tony McNamara's script, as you said, really elevates the source material. And then I love the costumes and the production. Just like I said, all the craft elements of this film just speak so much to me. Number two is Renaissance, a film by Beyonce. And I think it's a beautiful dialogue into the mind of the queen of the renaissance it follows the footsteps of homecoming but i think does it so much better across the board beyonce and her crew just gives like a peek behind the curtain of what goes on to making a masterful production a reality the way they go about switching back and forth between the stage production and the interviews is something that i think more concert docs should try to do in the future but the sound design is so immersive the costumes are so impressive but my number one is of course Oppenheimer I adore this film basically no issues 10 to 10 across the board Nolan's direction is hitting on all cylinders this ensemble headlined by Killian Murphy is just showcasing why these are all A-list actors Oppenheimer is a film I'm going to be re-watching year in and year out for years to come so that brings us to the end of this year that is a wrap on our 2023 awards coverage with our final awards now i'm going to put up a graphic on the screen it's going to basically just say like here are all of the nominations total across both of our awards so that is how these films performed overall between the two of us but that is the end of this video thank you for sticking with us through this very long award ceremony not as long as the oscars but um <laughs> We'll work on it next year. Uh, we would love to hear what all of you out there think. If you saw last year's show, if you watched this far in this year's show, maybe you like something. So drop us a like, comment down below. We want to hear your thoughts. So, I mean, you can drop all the categories. You can just drop your winners or you can pick one of them. Just let us know what you think. But until next time, my name's Dill. And my name is Matt. And we'll see you next year at Fantasy Film Ball.